January 2023 and for my first trip of year I've headed to Portugal's second city Porto for Atlantic sunsets and maybe a drop of a local tipple. Located on the north bank of the Douro River as it completes its 900 kilometre course across the Iberian Peninsula, Porto, along with its southern bank sister city of Villanova de Gaia, has been settled since at least the 8th century BC, with archaeological findings suggesting a Phoenician trading settlement at the mouth of the river. During the Roman occupation, it was an important commercial port, a role it continued through the Swabian and Visigoth times. Following their successful invasion of the Iberian Peninsula in 711, Porto fell under the control of the Moors, though by 868 the city had been reconquered by Count Emira Perez as he established the County of Portugal in the area north of the Douro River, but eventually expanded down the length of the peninsula to create the modern-day country of Portugal. In 1387, Porto was the site of the marriage of John I of Portugal and Philippa of Lancaster, sister of the future Henry IV of England, and with that helped to establish what's now the oldest recorded military alliance in the world, between Portugal and England. The 14th and 15th centuries saw Porto at the heart of the Portuguese Age of Discovery, as Prince Henry the Navigator set sail from the city on his conquest to Ceuta in northern Morocco, and in the following decades the Portuguese settled the Madeiran and then Azores archipelagos before skipping around the Castilian-run Canary Islands and discovering what is today Cabo Verde. The wine from the Douro Valley had long been transported down to the city, but by the early 18th century, the Methuen Treaty established trade relations between Portugal and England, and the English fancy for port wine took off. That connection still being visible in the very English names for some of the leading port brands, Croft and Taylor, being just two examples that light up for wine lodges of Gaia at night. The city briefly fell under the control of Napoleonic forces following the First Battle of Porto in March 1809. The troops were routed from the city just two months later by a combined Anglo-Portuguese army under the Duke of Wellington, using the port wine barges to speedily cross the Douro and outflank the French army. Following the overthrow of the monarchy in 1910, the city was briefly the capital of a restored monarchy of the north that lasted barely a month from mid-January 1919. After that, the country settled down into a republic. In 1996, the centre of Porto was added to the UNESCO list of World Heritage Sites, encompassing the medieval parts of the city, located inside the 14th century city walls. <laughs> The World Heritage Sites include the city's Cathedral of the Assumption of Our Lady, or simply the Sedo Porto. Work started on the current building in the second half of the 12th century, though there's been a church for the site before this. The double-deck Gothic cloister that sits on the south of the main building is decorated with painted tin glazed ceramic tile work, very typical of Portugal. With the tiling continuing on the upper floor of the cloister, where there's also a small museum, as well as access to one of the two square towers of the cathedral.
from the top of the tower of the cathedral, there are views out over the city and across the Douro to Gaia. For all the size of the cloister and buildings attached to the cathedral, the actual church itself is quite small and quite simply decorated. The same can't be said about the nearby church of St Francis. Built between 1383 and 1425 for an order of Franciscan monks, the church was designed in a plain Gothic style. However, in the 15th and 16th century, the church was chosen by prominent Porto families to become their pantheon, and in the 18th century, any adherence to Franciscan approach to living piously went out the window as the church became richly decorated in Baroque-style gilt woodwork. Today, the inside of the church just drips with gold on virtually every surface. The adjoining buildings, which were also once part of the monastery, still contain another small chapel. As well as a small museum and treasury. Meanwhile, down in the catacombs below the buildings is the original tombs and ossuary of the monastery, which you can wander around to take in all their slightly creepy glory. A short distance from the church and another richly decorated building is the Sal Bento railway station, whose over 20,000 ceramic tiles make this one of the world's most beautiful railway stations. As with any city located on the coast, it was important to protect the land, and consequently the Atlantic coastline is dotted with small forts and castles. On a cheese-shaped wedge of rock, located close to the harbour of Matosinos, sits the fortress of St Francis Xavier, though more commonly known as the Castello de Huejo, or Cheese Castle, referring back to the shape of a rock it sits on. The site was originally fortified sometime in the 15th century, however a new fort was constructed during the 17th century, though that appears to not have been constructed particularly well. By the 18th century, responsibility for upkeep of the fort had fallen onto the city of Porto, and due to its design and the changing nature of warfare, it played no part in the French invasion, not even in a defensive role.
By the end of the Civil War in the early 19th century, the fort had been destroyed, and in the 1860s a new fort was designed and built, taking advantage of the sea and rocks to build a natural moat and defend the fort with a drawbridge. From the 1890s until 1910s, the fort passed into the hands of the Fiscal Guard before finally falling out of military use. In 1934, it was classified as property of public interest, and there were proposals for it to be turned into a museum in 1938. However, fearing attacks by the Nazis, the site was reactivated as a fort and turned it into an anti-aircraft battery during World War II. The fort remained back in the hands of the military until the latter part of the 20th century. Today, that original plan of a small museum has been realised, with one of the rooms on the ground floor housing a small collection of arms and artefacts. However, the main draw is to head up onto the roof of the castle, where you get views along the Atlantic coast and down to the mouth of the Juro. The Douro River is a vital part of the two cities, Porto and Villanova de Gaia, granting them quick access to the sea for trade and exploration, but at the same time acting as a barrier between them. For a long time, boats were the only way to cross between the two cities, and that's a pretty steep walk down to the riverside and back up again on the opposite side. Over the centuries, bridges have been built across the river, and today six main bridges span the waters, providing both road and rail links across. And one of the best ways to see these bridges is to take a 50-minute cruise along the river. Starting off from the Caes de Ribeira, ships sail upstream under the 1880s Ponte Dom Luis I bridge. This double-deck bridge provides quick access between both the upper and lower towns on both sides of the bridge, with the upper deck being converted to part of the city's metro system in the early 2000s and now only open to pedestrians and metro trains. At its opening in 1886, it was the longest span metal arch bridge in the world. The bridge was designed by Theopilar Sedig, a disciple of Gustav Eiffel, whose influence can clearly be seen in its construction. Though Eiffel himself also has a presence in the city, with the now disused Ponte de Dona Maria Pia railway bridge, which opened in 1877, allowing trains from Lisbon in the south to reach the city and northern parts of the country. Eiffel's bridge closed to rail traffic in the early 1990s, replaced by the neighbouring Ponte de São João. Slightly further upstream, the main road route to the north bypasses Gaia and Porto on the 1995 Ponte de Flexo. Whilst back through the city centres and heading out to the coast, the 1963 Ponta de Arabida provides road links to the west of the city centre. The views of the bridges from the water are spectacular, but they're also pretty good when taken from the top deck of an open top bus as it crosses the sixth and final bridge of the Ponte in Santa Don Henrique that links the centre of Porto and Gaia by road. Villanova de Gaia is a separate city to Porto with its own government and history, though the city's fortunes are intertwined with its neighbour across the Douro. Whilst Porto is Baroque churches and monasteries, Gaia is home for wine lodges and caves that really made the money for the area, and that distinction is clearly visible from the viewpoint high above the city at Serra do Pila. Until 2011, the only way to get from the upper town of Gaia to the riverside was to walk down the narrow lanes and passageways past the wine lodges and caves. 
However, these days it's as easy to hop on the Teleferico de Gaia and take the four minute journey down through Riverside, taking some of the best views of Porto on the way down. Down on the riverside in Guy, you get the best views of the city of Porto in all its splendour across the water. And the restaurants on this side of the river aren't bad either, particularly for the views. Taking the cable car back up, choose to look towards the Dom Luis Bridge and the Cerro do Pilar for perhaps one of the most iconic views in Portugal. Located on the western coast of Europe, Portugal has some of the best sunsets, with the sun slowly descending down the Atlantic Sea, whether that's after a long summer's evening or at the end of a bright but cold January afternoon. All year round, crowds turn out at sunset to take in the views, whether it be from the Atlantic Coast Road and the beaches or the sea walls at the mouth of the Douro. or from the Sierra do Pilar viewpoint, or even, dodging for regular metro trains, the deck of the Don Luis Bridge. Porto Airport is located 11 kilometres northwest of the city centre and is linked to downtown Porto by metro trains every 15 minutes. The airport is the second busiest in the country and acts as a hub for EasyJet and Ryanair with links across Europe and for the Portuguese flag carrier TAP with links further afield to North and South America. Many other airlines provide links to Europe, North Africa, North America and the Middle East. Music